Um, my name is Suzanne Wasserman. and I'm the director of the Gotham Center for New York City History here at the CUNY Graduate Center. I want, first of all, to thank you all for coming out for our first forum of the 2014 season. We began in March 2000, so I believe this is the beginning of our 15th season. Please join us for our next forum on March 5th, right here in the recital hall, one out of three immigrant New York in the 21st century. Sociologist Nancy Foner and contributors talk about their new volume and absorbing anthology of in-depth portraits revealing the surprising new diverse realities of immigrant life in 21st century New York City. One out of three shows how nearly 50 years of massive inflows have transformed New York's economic and cultural life and how the city has changed the lives of immigrant newcomers. So please join us for that on March 5th. Okay, what we're gonna do tonight is I'm gonna introduce our speakers and then they're gonna go sit down so you can see, have a clear view of the images. I'm gonna introduce them in, in, in um, alphabetical order. So Phil Bicker, raise your hand. Okay, he who joined Time in 2010, he curates Lightbox, the 10 best pictures of the week for the iPad edition and Time's Picture of the Week online. He contributes as a photo editor to Time, time.com, and Time's photo website, Lightbox. Before working as a senior photo editor, Phil was an art director starting at The Face magazine in London. He later art directed Creative Camera magazine and was creative director of Vogue Om International and The Fader. Prior to joining Time, he was a creative director at Magnum Photos New York. Okay, next is Camilo Jose Vergara, right here. Born in Chile, Camilo Jose Vergara graduated from the University of Notre Dame and received an MA in sociology from Columbia University. He has received a grant from the MacArthur Foundation and a National Humanities Medal from President Barack Obama. Making repeated visits to the same locales over many years, he has documented changing social conditions in public housing projects, storefront churches, and the streets in New York, Chicago, Detroit, LA, and Camden, New Jersey. Harlem, The Unmaking of a Ghetto is his seventh book. Eric K. Washington, he's the second person from the left, is a local historian and author of Manhattanville, Old Heart of West Harlem. His book about one of greater Harlem's faded na historic neighborhoods inspired a City College of New York exhibit and a permanent interpretive signage and stall installation at West Harlem Piers Park, which earned him the Municipal Arts Society's Master's Award, Master Works Award. Just this past December, Eric coordinated two pilot programs at the Harlem YMCA, the Springboard of Perspective Speaking Speaker Series called Harlem Y Talks. His ongoing research has contributed exponentially to Trinity Church Cemetery's roster of notables, which includes the unmarked crypt of renowned Harlem photographer James Van Der Zee. Eric, um, let's see, Eric Citizens, I'm sorry, um, such as the, the Hotel Olga, the Frog Pound, Central Terminals, Red Caps, Aunt Dinah's Kitchen, and in Gotham Center's current blotter, the silhouette artist E.J. Perry. These are some of the numerous articles that continue to shed light on many of Harlem's dimly remembered corners. As a tour guide, Washington has been highlighted at length in Philip Lopate's Waterfront and Jonathan R. Wynn's The Tour Guide. And last but not least, Sharon Zukin. She's right there. Sharon Zukin teaches sociology here at the Graduate Center and at Brooklyn College. A prolific writer about urban life, she won the Jane Jacobs Award for her recent book, Naked City, The Death and Life of Authentic Urban Places, and the C. Wright Mills Award for an earlier book, Landscapes of Power, From Detroit to Disney World. Zukin has also received the Robert and Helen Lind Award for career achievement from the Community and Urban Sociology section of the American Sociology, Sociological, Associ Sociological Association. Okay, so we are gonna just go sit down here and we're gonna let Camilo show his images, right? Thank you, Suzanne, for inviting me and for thinking of me. And thank you, Charon, for suggesting this uh, venue, uh, place I like very much, the Graduate Center. At one point I thought of coming to study here. Uh, this book is many books. 
is many books in many, for many different reasons. I mean, the first reason is because I started it in my 20s, and now I'm a senior citizen. <laughs> so in my 20s, I was a different person. I saw the world in a different way, and I didn't think I was doing a book. I was just taking pictures out there. I was doing street photography. So that's 1970, 1973. Then I went to uh, study at, I was uh, studying sociology at Columbia. And for four years, all of this stuff kind of became devalued. I just thought, you know, what you use pictures for just to illustrate stuff. If you do sociology, you don't do photography. You use the pictures maybe to illustrate something. Images are useless if you are a serious social scientist. At least that's the message I got. Whenever I said, look, you know, there's more to me, I take pictures, they would say, well, you know, why didn't you try uh, to go to art school or exhibit in a museum? But basically, that was a separate thing. So uh, then that brought about a different me, which was a person that instead of being a street photography and photographing the things that I thought were interesting, that attracted me, that puzzled me, I said, well, what if I stay with something? Uh, why stay with something and photograph it over time? Because New York was falling apart. You know, you all know that New York was almost bankrupt in 1975, and, and I was out in the streets. So uh, what is there to photograph is not progress, because progress is not going to happen here. This stuff is not going to be rebuilt. You have the commissioner of housing saying, we got to think about shrinkage, how the city can get smaller, what do you do with the Bronx, you close the fire stations, the schools, and all of that stuff. So I wanted to document the process by which a city becomes something else. <laughs> you know, what? What Detroit is today. You know, so that's what we thought, uh, that's where at least I thought that's where New York was going to go in that direction. And uh, I thought, what an exciting job, but to document how a city disappears. You know, just, uh, you hear about those cities in the Bible and stuff, well, why New York can't be like that? So that then, I had a special tool to do that, which was to go back to places over time. So uh, here is a building. People are still living in there, but will they be living here next year? Or will they be here next in, within six months or seven months? And what's the shape that decline takes? What's the stuff they're going to take out the building, put outside in the streets? Are the dogs going to move in? Are the dogs going to live with the families? You know, those, all those questions that became very important to me. You know, why, uh, you know, when everybody was thinking the, use, the, the more useful things is, you know, how to bring life to all of these things, I was interested in, you know, how is this thing going to croak? And it didn't croak. So partly the story of Harlem is the story of uh, decline, a very, very strong, very, very, uh, uh, at one point there were parts of Harlem that looked just as bad as Detroit looks today, although Detroit was never as densely populated. But, uh, most of that has been rebuilt, and that's the story I want to tell. So, so those are the different periods that I went through. And uh, then if you get me set, I'll start. All I need to do is just press forward. I, I begin with a set of pictures that started in 1977, and it's a building 
that was located at 65 East 125th Street. I thought, I walked by, I, my idea at that time was to walk all the streets of Harlem, was to photograph all the blocks that I could, and then go up in tall buildings and photograph from the roofs. But I have selected a certain number of images to show to you today. You can see many more if you want to go on my website called Invincible Cities. This is a building that I particularly, I went uh, every year from 1977 to the present. And I want to stay with it to show you how it changed. It was a bar and it's right next to the station, the station that goes to Westchester from 125th Street. So that's, that's 1979. 1980, building became divided into two. The bar was not there anymore. One of the famous drug dealers of Harlem used to hold house there. And uh, I think his name was Barnes. There were two very famous drug dealers in Harlem. One was Barnes and the other one was Fred Lucas. Fred Lucas was the one that got Denzel Washington to play him. So, uh, I, I think that was part of an important way of setting up the Harlem that I saw through uh, because it was, you know, you thought of the pe people like Duke Ellington, you thought of Langston Hughes, you thought of Billy Holiday, uh, but the really the famous people of that period were two drug dealers. One was Fred Lucas and the other one was this one that... Uh, had his headquarters here, and uh, so it was. It was a place where, the, where those famous people who were alive, like uh, uh, Louis Armstrong, had moved to Queens because there was a section of Queens that took a lot of blacks that lived there. James Baldwin was living in Europe, uh, and so on. So. This building got split in two, and then the two places became, went each one a separate way. The place on, the, on your right, let me just see if I can light it up. Yes, yes, it's, it's, it's uh, the place that has the suits and stuff. That was a place that had the numbers games. Uh, and uh, you could tell them in Harlem because they had this place that made absolutely no sense. So you didn't know what, what was this store, what was the purpose of it. Uh, the ch changes continued. The one on the right had almost every, everything from doctor's office to kitchen cabinets to every year there would be a new store there, while the other one, the one on the right, stayed pretty much the same. Uh, until, uh, you know, they continue. This is almost to the year 2000, and this is to, to the middle of the year 2000, and at this time, the building, it's demolished, and it becomes a sleepies. And this is part of a phenomenon that's going through uh, all over Harlem, where very distinctive buildings became, that were unique and one of their kind became part of franchises. So Sleepy's, it's a franchise. And then from Sleepy's it turned into a church. And the church, it's also a, a global church. It's not a normal church. It's a church that you can see if you go in theaters, they usually take theaters. There are theaters in the Bronx where you have this church. There are theater, There are two in the Bronx. There's some in Brooklyn. There are some in Los Angeles, in Oakland, in San Jose. They are all over the country. It's a church that comes from Brazil, so it's a global church. So that's part of a trend where things go from become mom and pop they become, you know, from becoming a, a local business to becoming part of some sort of franchise, some kind of thing that is all over the place. Uh, now we go back to the first uh, documentation of Harlem, which took place in the 70s, in the early 70s, 1970. 
to 73. So this picture was taken in 71. And you get this sense of what Harlem was, full of holes, empty lots. Uh, I counted at one point 16 junkyards in Harlem. Uh, some of them were big and some of them were small, like the size of the building. So you can see the empty spaces. All of that has been rebuilt since then. Uh, this picture became actually quite popular. I was uh, a little bit ashamed of these pictures when I become, became a so-called serious photographer and I did buildings and over time stuff uh, because I thought, well, here there was Helen Levitt. She would go to the Bronx or she would go to Harlem or she would photograph in Manhattan, other parts of Manhattan and she would do what I thought were much better pictures. So I kept this in a shoebox and didn't show it to, to anybody. And then when I started showing them, they started running in the internet and they are everywhere. That one is particularly popular. <laughs> and it kind of amazes me because I just thought, you know, I did these pictures, what can I do with them? I didn't want to throw them out. And then I got them, showed them like two, three years ago and they started running. And this one makes it into a lot of fashion, fashion blogs. So you see the fashion models, and then you see this guy in the, sitting in the back of a Cadillac. And that's the cover of the book. For those who haven't seen it, and I don't know if there is copies of the book here, but uh, uh, in case there aren't, that's what the cover looks like. The, Change is tremendous there. That particular corner is becoming the Museum of African, African Art. And uh, the building was uh, designed by Robert Stern, who is probably the most uh, elite architect in, in working here in New York. So it went on from being a place full of debris and abandoned buildings in the back to a place with very expensive apartments and a museum on the first, uh, the ground floor and the first floor, the second floor, I think. What I find very interesting about that picture is although the neighborhood looks bombed out, the kids look perfectly well-dressed and they're carrying musical instruments. Uh, that was another image and this sort of keyed me to an interest of mine which was uh, the feeling that so much of what I call the museum, the sort of people's museum that gets on walls like you see in the back of that woman, gets lost. So I started and I did the, I started documenting the graphics, the graphics that I saw, even though they were the work of somebody else. So things like this, and this again is from the 70s, early 70s, uh, which you don't see anymore, which they have disappeared completely from, from Harlem. Uh, and sort of, to me, they meant the, the connection still existed between the South, where so many people came from, and, uh, and present, day, present day, in that time, Harlem, Harlem of the 70s. Uh, there was much, and uh, the Lower East Side particularly was full of uh, this imagery that had to do with the Black Panthers, with the idea of freedom, with Africa, with South Africa, Mandela and freeing Mandela, which, and, uh, and that's, of course, it, today, it's kind of a historic, historical images that, uh, that are not there anymore. You don't see them anymore. Uh, later, I began to see how certain spaces, particularly that spaces that had traffic, like around 125th Street, uh, that, that, that were not used, that were vacant or abandoned, and in this case is Brooks Bakery, became places to put advertisement. So I decided to follow that advertisement and see the shapes because I thought that the tastes of the day or what was popular in the city was going to be seen. 
So you can see here from about 89 to about 97, uh, a selection of images from that one particular uh, uh, storefront that was a bakery called Brooks Bakery. Here you see tires on the street, which in the New Harlem, you, would, you wouldn't see tires thrown on 125th Street. Uh, I, mean, I believe that you would get arrested very quickly if you were to do that. But back then, in, uh, in about 93, 94, this was a scene that was not uh, rare. And again, about there, about this time, the building was fixed, and then it became some sort of a store. There was uh, part of what I was interested in, and you can see it here, and uh, it's, it's how the hand of people could be seen, either on the way they presented buildings or they decorated buildings. This went back to me to pictures that Walker Evans took I believe around Delancey Street back in the 30s uh, in black and white. So, so some of this, uh, most of this has disappeared, but you still, it hasn't disappeared completely. You still, if you look carefully enough, you'll find examples like this. Uh, but you don't find examples like that. So during the period when the drug, drug epidemics was uh, very, very strong in, uh, in Harlem, as well as in other parts of the city and the country, what happened is that many people got killed in corners that today are uh, populated by middle class and upper middle class people as the, this corner, which is 124th and Lenox, and of course, that drug dealer got shot there, and this mural stayed there for the longest time. Uh, part of the reason I put it there, and I put more sometimes, is because it's, it's a form, it's an expression, it's something that was there that is not there anymore. I followed the last one, which was in East Harlem, the last one of those drug dealing murals. And I talked to the people in the store and I said, well, what happened? And they said, well, the police came here and they say, well, we had to clean up. The, you know, the wall was dirty. So they didn't sell, get rid of the mural, but basically uh, they said they had to do something and, uh, and then they whitewash it. So the drug dealer disappeared after the picture, the memorial had been there for maybe 10 years or longer. Uh, they, again, that, that image there, it's because the hand of people could be seen also in signs for churches. Uh, typically, the way they would uh, come to be would be that uh, somebody in the congregation had a child or a kid that uh, that was good in art so that they would buy supplies and they would do, they would come up with something like this. The change was very striking by the year 2000 or 2005, 2007. As you can see, big billboards started coming up with people like 50 cents. But instead of being people who uh, were fighting oppression or were, you know, Black Panthers or drug dealers or anything else. They were uh, describing or depicting people like uh, 50 Cent's reading the, keeping track of his investments on the Wall Street Journal. And, uh, and still some of the some of the images, and I, that, I'm told is one of the most famous images in African art, African Art 101, bronze from Benin, they tell me. And uh, what happened is that the business changed name. It was called Presidential Pizza. So they put the Presidential Pizza right in front of it so that if you pull out the sign that says Presidential Pizza, 
or 319 West 125th Street, you will find your picture. Uh, again, they, they, it's, I'm trying to say, I'm not trying to overstate this and to say, well, the hand of people or the sort of the old Harlem has completely disappeared because you still, in some streets or some areas of Harlem, you will see things like this. It's that somebody died there, so they made a sign and they put it in the bus stop or they put it on the corner, and it's something which you don't see in some uh, other neighborhoods, middle class and so on. I became interested in tracking the story of the statues, because I asked myself, if this is the capital of black America, where are the statues of black folks? So if I had looked Looking in 1970 up to about 2000, there were very few statues of black folks. And there was, this is John Henry, and it's uh, taken at the river, Harlem River houses. But it's not out on the streets, it's inside, it's in the courtyard. Everybody identified John Henry as a black man, but of course, you know, nobody, everybody thinks he's, a, he's, an, he's not a real a person, except that to many of the people there, he is real. So, and he's also black. So this uh, figure came up in the 30s, in the, in the late, uh, I guess the Harlem River houses were inaugurated about 1940, so that's the period when it came. In between, that and this big statue, which was put together, put up like some, sometime in the late 90s, uh, maybe in the year 2000, on the corner of uh, Fifth Avenue and 110th, and there's a circle there. So at that time, there was a serious attempt to honor a big, uh, famous, African-American figures in Harlem, the capital of black America. So they would, statues like this with the traffic changes that they had to make and so on would cost in the neighborhood of $2 million or maybe more. In this particular case, uh, the borough president of Manhattan was asked to contribute $400,000, but she was a feminist. And then she looked at this and she saw all those female figures <laughs> and she thought that this was exploitative. And, uh, but she gave the $400,000 anyway and she declared the statue to be aesthetically suspect. <laughs> so th this is Harriet Tubman also, another one that uh, cost about two, two point one million. Again, they came around the same period. I like to show this because it seems to contradict the first uh, a section of images that show uh, Harlem losing its idiosyncrasy, its character. At the same time, there is an effort, a public effort worth millions of dollars to sort of bring and say, well, this is uh, the African-American capital. So there is Harriet Tubman. And while Harriet Tubman was, uh, the statue was completed a few years later, this also one of the landmarks of Harlem, the Lenox Lounge, where people like Coltrane and Billy Holiday would gather and play, and Miles Davis uh, became too expensive a place, and this was like December of 2012. The owner had a right to the signs and to put the coverings in the outside, so he took it out, and he decided he was going to rebuild the Lenox Lounge down the street, which to me looked completely impossible. So the place looks like this today very much, except that it has a little more graffiti. And, you know, people say it's going to be a sushi place, but nobody, nobody knows for sure. 
Again, that's, this is another one of the places that disappeared. There was, uh, uh, that was the longest running black owned store in, in Harlem. Uh, I met Bobby, he died, he was about two, 92 years old. And he was a character in the neighborhood and everybody liked him very much. His store had been on 125th Street and then moved on the corner of, uh, of uh, almost on the corner of 125th Street at Frederick, Frederick Douglass. There were uh, stores like this and the idea came to me that it would be very interesting if you could sort of almost become the photographer of Harlem for the local barber, because the local barber is the local historian. And I used to go there to try to hear what was discussed, and issues like the proper way of eating watermelon was one of the subjects. The, the other one was, where do you get, uh, where do you get, uh, uh, pig's feet, so you can buy them across the street and so on. Uh, that's a funeral home, and it was a famous funeral home, which back in the 20s uh, was where celebrities were uh, taken, and uh, it became uh, closed, it closed about two years ago, and now it lost its name, and it's kind of waiting to become something else. So uh, what will it become? It's something that I like to be uh, waiting, and you know, so I'll see what, when it is, I'll go there. Uh, maybe it'll be McDonald's, maybe it'll be, you know, something, something else. He, uh, the end, one end of 125th Street, the one on the east side, had a number of Jamaican stores, and this was one of them, and it ended up as an internet, it, a store that sells in the internet, and it may be doing good business because they have a branch on Frederick Douglass, so they have two stores. That's the old Renaissance ballroom. Uh, what's left of it, some of the walls are going to be preserved. In the back, you can see the Abyssinian Baptist Church, which actually is uh, going to be putting a very tall building on that space. Uh, these are things that were there. You could see these garden spaces. There are a few, there may be a couple of them left particularly in uh, East Harlem. East Harlem, I think, has more of most of this. Uh, this was the largest one in Harlem, was in 117th, 118th, and Frederick Douglass. And it took almost an entire block. And uh, so he used to dress there, and they used to put a scarecrow. Also next to it, there was a, a junkyard, one of the 16 junkyards I mentioned. And, uh, and uh, the space is now a luxury building. And the space where the scarecrow was is a, it's a, uh, what do you call those coffee places? That, uh, Starbucks. <laughs> so when, when the revival of Harlem came up, and it was first, it first was the, the city, uh, you know, the federal government and the state that put money, and the money went first to rehab a lot of the abandoned buildings, to fix up the sidewalks, to fix up the medians, to take the tracks of 125th Street because they had trolley tracks that went through that. So when buildings were being fixed, they would uh, the, de the developers would bring dogs and the dogs would stay there to uh, guard the tools because otherwise the tools would disappear. A big uh, uh, event in the changing of Harlem was when Clinton came in and that was when Clinton was uh, 
welcome to Harlem. He, his office was, uh, was over the, all the way there, the second tall building, the, where the people are concentrated is a state office building. And then there is a tall building uh, to the east of that building, and he had the penthouse there. Uh, the, his presence was uh, a catalyzer that brought a lot of investment to Harlem, and the investment came to even places like this. This can show you like the extent of the, uh, of the destruction, the amount of ruins that were there in Harlem. This was taken in 1989 from a, a, a project called a public housing project called Drew Hamilton, 143rd and uh, Frederick Douglass. So if you look in the back, you can see the George Washington Bridge for those of you who want to know where, what you're seeing. So the, the, all of those buildings were cleared and then they were fixed. So you, if some of them were fixed and then all of these new buildings appear so this was part of the boom in Harlem. Uh, buildings like this were built, and this was built on uh, one tenth Street and Lenox. And I went there out of curiosity to find out what a two-bedroom apartment cost there, and they told me it was two and a quarter million dollars. So uh, the the new buildings. It was sort of an interesting pattern. Some of the new buildings, I think, the ones that were the, the commanded the highest price, were in areas that uh, where they didn't emphasize very much the sort of black history side of them. So they didn't have the name of the names of anyone of Harriet Tubman of, or Langston Hughes or any of those people, and those who were along. Frederick Douglass. And if you look at the lobbies, they didn't have African art or pictures of uh, great musicians and so on and so forth, but they tried to be like good, clean, well-built buildings in a nondescript area. It wasn't, they didn't, nothing said Harlem about them. If you look in other areas, they try to make them look like Harlem buildings. So, like this building was supposed to be ecological. Also, the outside skin uh, had some sort of African design. And if you went inside, you would see on the walls the entire invisible man, you know, just somebody took the book cut it into pieces and just frame it and it's on the walls of, of this building. Uh, this is the most elegant restaurant in, in Harlem so far, Red Rooster. This is where Obama went to raise funding. And, uh, and what, uh, what uh, uh, it stands, it serves a mixed clientele and what is very, it, it, very interesting to me is that the, you know, on the one hand, the place exists there, and across the street, there is this sort of the battle for Harlem that you can see here. This is right across the street from the restaurant. In other words, you have this sort of very, a lot of police activity. There is a lot of police presence, and the battle for Harlem to revitalize Harlem to make the crime rate go from uh, what it, what it, to a third of what it was back in the, in the 80s and, and early 90s when it reached its peak uh, was, you could see it being fought on the streets and you would see things like this uh, in, happening very frequently. Also, you would see these gizmos that were parked on the streets, often where crimes took place. Some elements of the old Harlem, like the statues that I showed before, uh, are or the barber shops, but you know they were brought there spontaneously, as you can see. 
uh, in this case, there is an interpreter that brings these images of lynchings to a place that is, it's across from the Apollo Theater. The images he takes from a book that the NAACP put together of five lynchings. So he gets the images, puts them up, and then the tourists walk by it, and they see this, and for some reason it persists. In other words, it's, it's there, it's been there for years, and the building where he puts them in is vacant, so he just puts a big blanket and puts his pictures every day. And that's the name of the book is up there. So uh, I was also interested in how do I get out of trying to show just uh, my view of Harlem, what's other folks' view of Harlem? So it's a, a one view, way to do that. It's, of course, you go to the barber shops and you go to the, to the funeral homes. But another way to do that is to go to the rappers. You know, the rappers post themselves rapping in, uh, in YouTube. So you go and look at them there, and you find out what are the places that they post themselves in and at what time of day they post themselves in. So this is the kind of places where the rappers do their rapping. So, so to them, uh, I mean, I deducted from there that these are the most significant places in Harlem for them. is not the Apollo Theater. is not the Schomburg Center. is not Harlem Hospital. But it's places like this, it's lobbies of housing projects, it's hallways. Oh. And then this place kind of came to me as a surprise because it's a chain of five restaurants or six restaurants in Harlem that it's a local chain. It's not like a McDonald's or a Burger King. And it seemed to have generated in Harlem and it's run by Latinos. And, uh, and it's, very, it, it's geared to black. So if you go in, you find a black clientele, Latinos serving them, and then the pictures on the walls are, all, are those Duke Ellington and, and, and you know, the Statue of Liberty and, and so on. So this becomes a place that the rappers may go there and sit and rap. It also becomes a place where the old folks go and sit and they just spend the day there talking. I was interested in the issue of elegance. People talk about the style, particularly the style of the folks that walk down on 125th Street that are sitting there on a Sunday. Uh, and in this case, it's in front of the Apollo Theater, and here's a limousine driver, a woman that's coming from church, uh, a couple that's coming from church, and the couple is from the West Indies. And then there is the other side of elegance, which is vulgarity, which you also find in, in, in Harlem. This is in the Puerto Rican Day Parade. And that's the African American Day Parade. And that is just a Sunday at the park in Marcus Garvey Park. Uh, people still spill over in the streets, maybe not as much as they did before, but if you go on a Sunday, particularly this church, you see some churches own their buildings. So they managed to remain there. They weren't kicked out when the prices went up or when, you know, to put another building there. So that like, this particular church is there and doesn't intend to sell its place. Uh, there are the street evangelists that you still see that, that, that they're still in the streets of Harlem, and there is still about 300 churches, although the number of storefront churches has declined. But, uh, but you still see plenty of religious activity. Religious activity has been partly integrated with tourism as the tour buses come in on Sunday and people go to the churches for service and to hear the singing. That's one of Harlem's characters. Uh, when you, uh, you know, in the past, if you would uh, 
uh, check and see who the famous ministers were. You would kill, get uh, Daddy Grace and you would get uh, Adam Clayton Powell. Well, today, if you do that, you, or until recently, you used to get this reverend that uh, took Obama as being his enemy, and he's, his story is James David Manning. Uh, he also tried to organize a boycott of stores in Harlem and a rent strike. Again, the tourists uh, are a presence there. Harlem is getting about a million tourists a year. Uh, Harlem has a tremendous uh, recognition as a place. It's one of the top places top neighborhoods in Manhattan, maybe the number one or number two neighborhood in Manhattan in terms of recognition internationally. Buildings still, there are buildings that manage to get through. I don't want to give you the feeling that, uh, that everything has been raised and everything is new in Harlem. This is uh, Graham Court, a building that went up in 1906. It was built by John Astor. You can see how everything around it has almost been rebuilt. And, yeah, yeah. and, uh, and, and that's another landmark of Harlem where du, du Bois and, and uh, Thorgood Marshall used to live. Uh, again, that's, uh, that's Strivers Row. It's uh, the north side of Stryver, Strivers Row down by Sanford White. This gives you an idea that still exists and it's still like it. It gives you the idea of the grandeur of Harlem and the reason why so many blacks in the 20s and 30s ask, we can't hold to this very long, we're going to get kicked out of here. Still, there are very poor places in Harlem, like Lexington Avenue on 125th Street, the corner that Lou Reed wrote about, you know, when he wrote that song called Waiting for My Man, it's the, it, this corner. That's where you go and, ca and change your bottles and cash your, your cans. And again, this, which at one point, and in many cities have become demolished, the public housing projects, are now in Harlem, the one place where uh, poor people can still remain. So to some extent, the character of Harlem, uh, it's, uh, they, they are like the anchors of the character of the traditional Harlem. That's where a lot of people who sing in choirs in churches live. Uh, that's where the low income and poor working class people live. Again, the parades, there are parades, still parades in Harlem. They used to be, they used to talk about parades every week, but now you get maybe three or four parades a year. Yeah. The Apollo Theater has become like the big shrine where you celebrate and you, uh, and you remember the memory of all the greats, uh, in this case, Michael Jackson, but some many others. And the f most famous blacks at one point, and I'm getting reaching the end, the f most famous blacks that in the 20s and 30s would be visible in the streets, like there's a line in Langston Hughes, he had a character that spoke for him called Simple. So Simple says, I, I was out the, the street and I saw Duke Ellington. Well, you could... Uh, uh, you can't say today I was out the street and saw JC because JC is somewhere else, but you can see a t-shirt with JC. So, and the last picture is, has to do with this, this sort of thing that the kind of, uh, the importance more probably to, that of social class and of race. I don't know if that's just the thing of Harlem if the, or if that's like a national characteristic, but uh, this picture kind of symbolizes to me how uh, 
how race is becoming less and less important, how you can walk through Harlem and people are not going to go and ask you, unless you are in some very specific places, what are you doing here? Are you lost? So, uh, so uh, with that, I'd like to thank you for, for uh, listening and uh, happy to present. Thanks for those terrific images, Camilo. Uh, they, 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 they really speak. Uh, at, at first I thought I was here to praise Camilo, but now I realize that I represent the road not taken, the sociologist who writes and can't take pictures. So uh, I will, I will you know, uh, make, make up for uh, that, uh, that un, untaken road. And just, just kind of riff off what, uh, what Camilo showed us, because I too have, have written about Harlem and I've, I've even used in my last book that sequence of photos that begins on 125th Street with the bar that's then subdivided and becomes the, you know, all, all kinds of other uh, 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 sorts of facilities before it turns into a sleepies, which I uh, condemned to words, which I uh, interpret as the, the visual version of the rezoning of Harlem. So that uh, Sleepy's becomes a, the image of Sleepy's becomes a forerunner of the development of those new apartment houses. And the tires on the street uh, to me represents, in the middle of the 90s, represents the days just before the business improvement district was established on 125th Street, uh, a bid that has just celebrated its, uh, that has recently celebrated its 20th anniversary. And I see some of those, um, I see some of those images from the late 90s as uh, representing the, the groundwork that the um, empowerment zone, the Upper Manhattan Empowerment Zone, began to work on the, the terrain of redevelopment where the capital invested by the, uh, the city, state, and federal governments uh, did not actually renovate apartment houses. Maybe some city funds did, but not the, not the UMES funds, the empowerment zone funds. Uh, there was uh, a, a, um, a gap of, of several years between the uh, U.S. Congress funding the empowerment zone and the money actually coming down the pipeline because, as far as I understand, there was a political battle over who would control those funds. And the, the forces that won were the forces championed by the Republican governor of the state at that time, George Pataki, and the Republican mayor of New York City, uh, Rudolph Giuliani, who very much wanted the capital investment to go into business development, not social services and not housing redevelopment. So the, uh, the, the pictures that you showed of the late 1990s to me represent the, the terrain that was being fought over. Which way would it go? Would it go toward social services or would it go toward business development? And we see from your later photos which, which side won out. For me, the, the real power of your photos is that they are photos not just of Harlem and not just of US history in Harlem, but they are photos of space and time. And I, I understand them at, at the deepest level as images of time as a subject. Those are your time lapse. Uh, photographs, but also your, your older photographs. So some people have compared you to Jacob Rees and Lewis Hine. You've compared yourself to your, uh, your models, if not your predecessors also, Helen Levitt, Roy de Carava, Cartier-Bresson. Uh, I also see in your photos Charles Manville, uh, of whose work there is an exhibition now at the Metropolitan Museum. He documented the, the Paris that disappeared in the 1860s. And you've documented the New York that has disappeared uh, in the, um, the, late 19, the late 20th and early 21st centuries. Uh, your work also reminds me of the um, British director Terence Davies, particularly his great documentary and memoir of Time and the City, 
where uh, you can not just see but feel the, uh, the, the modernization, in his case, of, of Liverpool that destroyed uh, both the anxieties and the detritus of, uh, of his early years. Uh, I, I also see, with time as a subject, the uh, great films uh, Farbique and Big Far, made by the French director Georges Rouquier, uh, where you, you, not just, you don't just see uh, a vanished way of life, but you see the, the, uh, the, the lurch into modernity from one image to the next, from in his Rouquier's case, from one film to the next. And I see August Sander, only in your case, you're making a topology of buildings and uh, streetscapes. And I see Jamil Shabazz, who's, uh, who recently spoke up in, up in Harlem, who documented um, African-American street life in Brooklyn in the 80s and, and 90s. So I, I, I see a, a a, a biography of you, the photographer, a biography of Harlem, a biography of the city, a biography of, of America in your images. And it's, uh, it's thrilling and, and moving. And then, of course, I see my own written work, because I've also tried to write about authenticity and the sense of moral ownership, particularly in black neighborhoods in the past 20 years. So I'll, I'll just leave you with this, uh, with, with this uh, set, of, set of images where I went back to the, the movie Shaft from the 19, what, early 1970s, directed by Gordon Parks, uh, filmed in Harlem and in Times Square and, and Greenwich Village. And what I took from, from that for my work was a scene where Robert Roundtree's talking on, uh, Richard Roundtree, talking on the phone with uh, his, his girlfriend. He, in the he has the character Shaft. And she says, what's wrong? I hear something wrong in your voice. What's wrong? And he says, what's wrong? I'm, I'm poor and I'm black. That's what's wrong. And that was his condition. That was his existential condition. And that was the condition of Harlem. And when Camilo asks about authenticity, I'm also asking about authenticity. Is Harlem less authentic as a black community if it's not poor? Or is it any less authentic as a community if it is neither poor nor black? So, thanks. Well, thank you, Camilla. It's funny, I um, was born in Harlem, but I left um, not of my own volition when I was three weeks old. Uh, <laughs> um, and my parents uh, were of the generation, um, well, my grandparents met from different destinations. Uh, my grandfather from the South and my grandmother from uh, the Caribbean. Uh, in Harlem, during the the Renaissance years of the, of the 20s. My father was born in Harlem and still lives in Harlem. And um, then I was of that generation that uh, I guess it was typical of um, people who were born and raised in Harlem by the 1950s decided to get their kids out to a nice place to live. So it ended up being Staten Island. Um, <laughs> but I escaped and came back. <laughs> Um, but when I came, had come back to Harlem when my parents divorced and I, I came to move with my father, I arrived about the same time as you did. So I'm surprised we never crossed paths. But it's interesting, um, and there are a lot of favorite moments in, in, in the book when you, you see things that, uh, that you've passed a number of times and um, you just open them up in a whole other way. I, I always like, I, I, one of the hats I wear is as a, a, a tour guide, so I always like to start when I'm doing a Harlem tour anyway. Um, how many of you um, have never been to Harlem? Oh, that's, wow, <laughs> okay. Um, I was expecting, you know, an off balance. Anyway, I, uh, Suzanne asked me to, to say something about the history of Harlem, so this is 
you know, obviously Harlem has a very long history, so uh, with apologies to Tom Stoppard, I might call this Harlem the 15-minute Hamlet. Um, <laughs> so it will be very broad. But it, it's, always, it's often struck me that Harlem was built on a dare. Um, I'd say even in the, in the 17th century, the stakes were very high. Uh, the Dutch colonists uh, left the walls of New Amsterdam all the way down at the southern tip of Manhattan uh, to settle up in Upper Manhattan's uh, hinterlands. Um, for the African slaves who's, who were mandated to, to build a road to New Harlem by uh, the Dutch governor, Peter Stuyvesant, it was arduous labor. And uh, it was a dare also because uh, the neighbors were hostile. This was uh, Indian territory. Um, and the mission compelled the village's original settlers to, to coexist despite the fact that uh, they had uncommon native languages. Uh, even though it was a Dutch colony, most of them were not indeed Dutch. Uh, I think uh, there was an estimated 18 different languages being spoke uh, by, by villages in those days. Um, then, maybe three and a half centuries later, uh, the stakes were still high in the early 20th century. Um, as speculative uh, developers chose whether they preferred to rent to African Americans or to go broke. What would you do? Yeah, um, Because they were stuck with a lot of uh, empty, brand new apartment buildings that were built as a direct result of the new rapid transit. And you know, they say, if you build it, they will come. That's usually the case, but in this case, it kind of backfired and they were stuck with a lot of empty buildings. So it was a kind of a, you know, a Sophie's choice for them to make um, whether or not they would accept black, black tenants. Um, it was a no-brainer. Um, yet there were associations that mobilized to thwart the African-American invasion, uh, as they called it. Uh, undaunted, uh, blacks defied persona non grata status to migrate to Harlem. Uh, they challenged so-called covenant blocks, uh, which restricted them, uh, and paid higher rents than whites for the privilege of, of living uh, uptown in these, in these brand new um, habitations. Uh, but even after pulling up stakes from elsewhere, because um, blacks came from other parts of the city and, and states in the south, uh, to put down roots in Harlem, new African American, uh, new, the new African American community faced uh, another challenge. I would say that was uh, social survival really defied blacks to affirm and celebrate a collective memory and, and experience. Uh, the bibliophile Arturo Schomburg um, you've all heard of the, the Schomburg Center. I think he came to personify that dare, that particular dare. Uh, legend has it that as a, a, a young man in, in Puerto Rico where he was from, a teacher told uh, Schomburg that Africans had no history worth noting. Uh, he debunked such received wisdom by avidly co collecting books, manuscripts, maps, ephemera, and varied chronicles of the African diaspora's achievements and aspirations. Those aspirations really play into this evening's theme, uh, which is to talk about this wonderful um, uh, book of, of photographs and text. Uh, it may be telling that uh, you know, one of the first black businesses that were established in Harlem was a photography studio. Uh, in 1909, Walter Baker opened his studio at the southwest corner of Lenox Avenue and 133rd Street. I think it's now a, a vacant lot. Um, another prominent photographer was uh, Randolph McDougall, uh, who was uh, well known for his excellent architectural work, and he was the only black photographer who was hired by Underwood and Underwood. Uh, a lot of you who don't, you know, the, those stereopticons that make things look 3D or give you a headache by trying, you know, uh, he worked for, for that company. Um, and in 19, uh, Baker's studio was particularly, it particularly epitomized what Harlem's chief cultural arbiters were really, really eager to show off. Uh, in 1914, they mounted a five-day long event uh, called the Autumn Exposition and Amusement Festival. It was kind of like a, a mini World's Fair that was sort of a black-owned world, World's Fair that was based in Harlem at the Manhattan Casino on 155th Street in Bradhurst. Uh, they build the event explicitly as an advertising affair, the most stupendous and the first and only thing of its kind ever offered by our people. And the Walter Baker School uh, of Photography, which grew out of his studio, was training numerous black photographers. So they offered Walter Baker, our Harlem photographer, as they were proud to say, two displays on the balcony floor. 
And the organizers' wish list was exhaustive. They called for excellent photographs of the exterior and interior of Negro banks, also photos of the officers and directors. They asked for photos of insurance companies, wholesale houses, and any and all uncommonly successful Negro businesses. They wanted photos of an interesting article of any kind that someone might intend putting on the market. The exposition's planners comprised some of the most prominent business and professional men and women of the race. Chiefly, they were the frogs as everybody knew them. This was a, a fraternity uh, um, of widely known black theater, uh, theater men and newsmen. Uh, their building called the Frog Pond still stands uh, unattended, vacant. It's a townhouse on 132nd Street. Um, some of them are names that may or may not be familiar to you. Alex Rogers, Sam Corker, Lee Whipper, Jesse Shipp, Fred R. Moore, Lester Walton, um, Bert Williams, um, Bob Cole, uh, James Weldon Johnson, and, and so on. Their conscious aim was to alter biased public perceptions, to champion race-positive images, to secure the race's groove for posterity, and establishing a photographic record and homegrown Harlem photographers was seen as clearly vital to that mission. I think Camillo's book is very much in that same tradition. It's an extraordinary takeaway from Harlem's earliest essays at self-examination. The book borrows the title of Gilbert Osofsky's classic study, Harlem, The Making of a Ghetto, and turns it really very optimistically like a plant towards the sunlight. I particularly, uh, although it's, uh, Camilo's book is basically uh, based on his, his magnificent photos, there's some wonderful text, and I partic particularly appreciated that Camillo invoked James Weldon Johnson's reflection in 1930 from his book, Black Manhattan. Uh, Johnson saw how unprecedented the anchoring of blacks in Harlem was. It prompted the inevitable question, will the Negroes of Harlem be able to hold it? Now Johnson was proud, but he wasn't cocky. He conceded the ruthless nature of progress made it unlikely. But whatever their next move, he predicted that blacks would share its authorship in the nature of a bargain. So how will this historic and legendary 20th century community negotiate through 21st century odds? That's certain to be Harlem's next unscripted challenge. And I think Camillo's book will be an enduring visual reference of what's at stake. Thank you. Thank you, Camillo. Um, uh, I have a bunch of non sequiturs to kind of observe from uh, what we've just seen and about um, Camilo's work in general. Um, I mean, Camilo's work is um, exceptional for the reason that he actually, actually returns to places that most outsiders don't even venture into. That's really important, I think. Um, the fact that he rejected as unoriginal his uh, influences, Helen Levitt, Walker Evans, Cartier Bresson. Um, whereas many photographers today, 50 years later, are still emulating that work. The aesthetics are actually dominant over, this, over the content of most work. Um, when we think about Magnum, and we think about um, the ways that those pictures are actually pushed forwards, um, the aesthetics of those pictures dominate for the most part. Um, Santiago Lyon at AP once described a photographer who I was working on a piece about as a triple threat. Um, he could take great photos, he could write, and he had uh, journalistic rigor. Camilo has all of those things, but above and beyond that, he's a true original. Um, when we think about the likes of Magnum photographer, photography, we kind of ele elevate that work um, we should see Camilo's work in the same way as we see the work of the FSA, um, Library of Congress, Smithsonian. He's a one-man Smithsonian. Um, the worth of that work, in hindsight, when we look back to that work, when we look back to the daguerreotypes, when we look back to Disfalma, when we look back to all these things, we can do it with hindsight. Camilo has this amazing ability to recognize instant nostalgia. He doesn't know where the path is taking him. He documents things not knowing where they're gonna go. As he explained, 
You know, he didn't know whether New York was going to be wiped out in the biblical sense, but he was willing to work towards something and adapt and to build and to continue to build over 40 years that work. When you look at the work of the, not only of Harlem, of Detroit, of Camden, of, of Newark, of all these places, the World Trade Center work, nobody has work without exception. No one person has the work that he has. Um, I recently went back to London to see my mum. I hadn't been back there for 10 years. And as I walked around, I thought of Camilo every step of the way. All the small stores had disappeared in the suburban London that I had visited. You know, everything was different. My heart went out to my memories. And I think the people of Harlem look at this work in the very same way. It's something which they hold dear to themselves. There's no other record of that stuff. The murals that Camilo's taken pictures of, those people can look back to those things as memories, memories well lost to time, memories they probably don't even realize they actually had. When I worked at The Fader, um, which is a music magazine, independent music magazine, um, predominantly hip-hop magazine, independent music, uh, I had a whole library of books in my office. And the DJs and the um, rappers that frequented that office, the one book that disappeared that never came back was American Ruins. It, it, I know who took it. I asked him. He said he would bring it back, but he couldn't bring himself to bring it back. He came back to me one day and said, I can't bring it back. I just, I just can't bring it back. I said, why don't you buy a copy? He said, well, I don't need to buy a copy. I can steal one from you. But the whole idea was that that book meant so much to him. At that point in time, Cameron and the Diplomats and Jim Jones were Harlem's new rappers of, of import. And within Camilo's work, this guy could see the relevance of their history and their influence. Um, and again, as I said, there was no other record of that work. You know, it's a, it's a place where those people can find lyrics and can make um, statements of fact because Camilo's documented them. They may be too young to have actually realized those things themselves and seen those things, but Camilo's documented them. Um, I think that's really important. Um, so, you know, I just think we owe Camilo a lot. I'd like to thank him again. Thank you. We, we have about 10 or 15 minutes for questions. And also, I wanted to say that Camilo's book is for sale out front. So please buy a copy, and he'll be happy to sign it for you. Um, do, any questions from the audience? I'll repeat it so that everyone can hear if you want to stand up and if you want to raise your hand. and Yes. Okay, the question is, will Harlem be Harlem when it's no longer poor or black? I'm asking Camilo to, to try to answer because he takes the pictures. He, you know, he looks through the lens. He has looked through the lens. Uh, at, at Harlem over the past uh, four decades. What, what do you think remains? Well, it's a, it's a very hard question and a question that normally I wouldn't like to answer because what I want to do is be faithful to the present. In other words, I want to be able to record what I see, what I live in, and I think in the past, you used to believe in progress. You used to believe that things were going to get better. And because things were going to get better, things that stay behind were less important. With the diminishing belief in progress, I think some of those things that we walk by in the past and we didn't see have becoming, are becoming more and more important. So, you know, it's not, it's not in my nature to kind of look at the future. It's kind of, what I like to do is to look at the past and have a flash and say, so that's what that was, rather than say, what's going to happen in 20 years? I don't know. Maybe my children will find out, but... 
I'd, I'd, I'd just like to add, add a, uh, um, a, a point. Uh, to, be, to be fair, uh, Harlem has always had residents of different social classes, particularly in the, in, in the uh, 1920s and 1930s when racial segregation was so severe that uh, the most famous African Americans were living in the same districts of cities as, as, as household servants and factory workers. So in those days and in, 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 decade, in even the, the, the most crime-ridden, uh, disinvested, uh, dirty decades, uh, there were still families that managed to hang on to the houses that they owned. And uh, there were also different streets. Driver's Row is a, you know, a very well-known example. There were different streets, different, different parts of Harlem that had different characters from the rest of the, of, of the very large area of the city that Harlem represents. So, you know, our, our overwhelming image, the, 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 it was a hegemonic image of, a, of, a, of an anti-hegemonic area of the city was, you know, the image of Harlem as poor and black. But there, you know, there is something about what we sociologists sometimes call with uh, great awkwardness, the intersection of race and class, in this case the intersection of black identity and poverty that historically uh, also came to represent the, the authenticity of Harlem. Do you want to say something, Eric? Yeah, I was going to say it's an interesting question because the question of authenticity is, is always very subjective, um, having to do with uh, it's, it's, it's not racially divided, but it's divided by generations, um, by sections of, of the area. Um, if, often when I give a tour of any place, uh, but say specifically um, in Harlem, or, 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 or well, my book is on, I came through Harlem through a side door, Manhattanville, is a, West Harlem, and people say, uh, what, are the, what are the boundaries? Um, and that's a most common question on any kind of tour. And it's like the, the I can say, Unequivocally, it depends on who you talk to. Um, if my parents live on Lenox Avenue, Lenox Avenue's n name has been changed to Malcolm X Boulevard. Um, a younger generation embraces the latter. Um, my parents' generation find it very, very inconvenient, especially if they're giving directions. So I think that um, it's always kind of I'm not sure what the answer to that is, but it's it, other than to say that it's it's always kind of it'll depend on who you're talking to or who you're asking. You know. I think that's right. Other questions? Yes, in the brown. Yes, you, sir. Yeah. Okay. Is Harlem still capable of having an essence? Anybody want to answer that? What do you mean by an essence? Yeah. I, I was trying to be careful to say that yes, that's the trend. The trend is through franchises, globalization, through uh, buildings that have a certain homogeneity in their looks. Uh, but that doesn't completely close the issue of uh, idiosyncrasy, of character, of personality. And uh, I believe that I show some images, like that image of announcing, somebody announcing the death of his mother in a bus stop. And um, that's a recent image. So, so, so uh, 
the character of Harlem uh, as it expressed a lot of the pictures that show fashion and dressing are recent images. Those kids in the park, the, the people on the street corners, those, uh, those are pictures that to me represented Harlem and I was happy to share them with you because when the Studio Museum of Harlem picture and had to picture elegance in Harlem, they just showed photographs of people who depicted this very snappy dressers, but left out this whole other sort of aggressive vulgarity which you do see there. So, uh, so Harlem certainly has a personality and has, has character and, and, and it hasn't been lost, certainly. Uh, and it also has a lot of institutions that are in place there and their whole uh, mission consists in keeping that, uh, that uh, you know, the history of Harlem alive. You know, I, ju I just want to add that, that Camilo himself has documented uh, that Harlem, like, like districts of cities all over the world, yes. has become much more standardized uh, and depersonalized than, you know, than, than years ago. Hand-lettered signs, you, you, know, you, you don't find much anywhere anymore. And a part of the essence of, uh, of Harlem as a, a district where historically lots of migrants came from rural areas of this country and the Caribbean and other countries of the, of the world, um, and also as a low-income area, always had a very rich street life. And, but Camilo showed a, a picture, a, a recent, a fairly recent photograph of uh, churchgoers after the service, you know, out on the sidewalk. But, you, you, you find that in, I, 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 at least I find, maybe you find too, in, in Harlem, as in other neighborhoods, uh, there's much less street life than before. You know, their life has become, for individuals as well as for organizations, life has become a much more interiorized life instead of life being lived on the street. So, um, you know, there, there are just all of these observations uh, about, uh, again, the subject is time. It's not, just, it's not just that the subject is Harlem, the subject is time, too. Yes. Interesting. Other questions? Yes, yes. So the question is, were you able to document people's reactions, longtime residents' reactions to what, what was happening in Harlem? Well, yes, and there's, there are lines in the book <laughs> I can remember. <laughs> I used to go to to public phones, you know, like I, if you go to the train station there and overhear conversations, you know. So uh, 
you sometimes you, you would overhear conversations to say, well, things look very quiet now, but, you know, just wait for a minute and they'll be much more colorful than I am at what they were saying, you know, and all of this is going to explode, you know, so, so, uh, and somebody's going to cut the cables and, you know, the whole place would be isolated and, and so on. But, as the gentleman before, I see the, I see that there is a certain degree of harmony in Harlem. That uh, that you, well, maybe you know, maybe it's happening all over the country that that, that the racial tension is not what it used to be. You, you know, the, the the kind of immediate hate that you would feel sometimes when you were in the wrong neighborhood just because you were different it's it's so much rarer today you just and i think it's a blessing so on that note i think we'll end and let, uh, let's thank everyone and thank you please go out and buy camilo's book and he'll be happy to sign it for you thank you